Hi, and welcome everyone. We heard you. Let me start there. There was so much interest in the most recent conversation we had about workplace trends for 2023, and we're back. So the, the energy, the crazy number of questions and comments and topics made it clear that this is an important topic for us to continue to talk about, share insights, ideas, information, hear from you. So we've decided to launch Office Hours, HOK's informal recurring LinkedIn Live conversation. So thank you for joining us today. And who better to have these conversations with than our in-house experts, HOK's Director of Workplace, Kay Sargent, and our firm-wide Director of Interiors, Tom Pellucci. So our previous discussion, as we said, had so many interesting comment, comments, topics, thoughts, we are gonna dive right back in with some of them, but as always, we encourage you to please post your comments in this, the questions in the comment section, and we will get to as many of them as possible during this conversation. And then afterwards, we will go back in, engage, and just encourage you to, to please keep sharing. Um, but let's dive right in, because there's so many questions and things to talk about. Kay. Chat GPT and generative AI exploded in the news on everyone's mind over the past couple of weeks. Yeah. Is this something that your clients are thinking about and its impact on workplace and workforce? Well, you're just going to dive right into that one, aren't you, Stephanie? Yep, I'm going to the big one. So, so here's what I would say, actually. You know, we have been talking about artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things for five plus years, we actually did a presentation at Cornet five years ago about artificial intelligence and how it's impacting the workplace. It already is impacting the workplace, but I think it's just kind of each time one of these new things kind of comes out and really revolutionizes everything or makes people kind of sit up and take notice, there's kind of this renewed focus. Um, we already have smart building management systems uh, we're doing a lot with sensors, you know, we, we are collecting a lot more information and data. So it is absolutely a topic that our clients are talking about. And it's one that we encourage them to think about because we really believe that smart technology can enhance the experience of individuals. And for a long time, we've been using that technology to enhance the operation of our buildings but what are we doing to enhance the experience of the users? And the analogy that I often use is if you think about a car, by the way, I have five kids, so I don't have one of these cars, but my neighbors have a car that they can start while they're in their house. Car gets nice and warm. And as they're walking down to the car with a fob in the pocket, it automatically unlocks. They get in and it knows who that person is that's gotten in because of that fob in their pocket. And everything in the car is adjusted to their preset preferences, right? Whether it's the mirrors or the music or the temperature and your phone and your computer can sync with your dashboard. In workspaces, most people are still crawling around trying to find an outlet. So it is about time that we truly embrace this notion that technology can have a huge role in enhancing the user experience and also helping us gather information, helping us uh, manage spaces better, helping us find each other, helping empower each other. So if I'm sitting in a spot at the building and maybe somebody's talking and they're too loud or I'm too cold or it's just not the right setting for me, I can quickly look at an app with all that information that's being pulled down from those sensors and find something that is more suited to my personal preferences at any time. That's when we really are leveraging that power to enhance and improve the human experience. And that's when people will be all in on the technology side. Fabulous. Now, Can I, I add know, something? Of course. Hi, everybody. Um, I think what's going to be interesting about things like AI and chat GPT, if I got that right. Um, it's the impact on our clients' work. And what is that going to mean in terms of uh, the, the employee population and what their needs will be and whether or not folks might get replaced by some of this stuff? I think that's, that's going to be an interesting set of conversations we're going to have with clients as this kind of technology really becomes embedded 
into workflow. I'm fascinated by just talking to my nieces and nephews that are, you know, in college and they're telling me how they could use this technology to write papers. And so you can kind of start to get a sense pretty quickly about how organizations are trying to deal with this this kind of technology in in the case of 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 these kids in my life. You know, some of these schools are blocking uh, the, the access to this this kind of technology. So it's it's very disruptive, and I think it's going to create an impact on the way we think about space and use space. Oh, I got I got to add in on that one because you know, one hundred percent agree with, with what you're saying. Look, I, I think this notion that there's technology that's going to replace jobs. People live in fear of that. But the reality is there are a lot of dirty, dangerous jobs. And I'm willing to bet that all of us right now would probably agree we're spending way too much time on emails and sitting on Zoom calls, et cetera. So if some of this technology can streamline that or make it so that it frees us up to do more meaningful, impactful things, then I think we should all be for that, right? And so Um, I actually am excited about the opportunity that this could simplify some of the tasks that we're doing and free up our ability to then focus on what's really, really important. And yeah, it probably means there are going to be some jobs that are eliminated, but every time we eliminate a job, other ones are created. So when you think about um, manufacturing and when we brought robots into manufacturing, there were a lot of people that got laid off. But there was a whole new industry that evolved with robotics and engineering and, manu- and and overseeing those. So we just need to understand how things are shifting. And I think there's also a, a, a balance between machines are really kind of telling us what is the right thing or what's the efficient thing. But humans really, it's that emotional connection. It's the, what do we do with that knowledge? It's how do we apply that and how do we make better judgment calls? And so it really is a balance between the two, I think, going forward. We just need to find that right spot. Well, the other buzzword, I don't want to conflate AI with the metaverse, but I'm just hitting, hitting all the buzz, buzz. Case for everything, right metaverse. Um, you know, we've also heard a lot about it. It isn't new. There, I know, isn't even a, an overall consensus about how we're defining it. Right. right. What are what is the latest? What are your clients saying or doing or ignoring about the metaverse and the workplace? That it that it's coming. I mean, it's here. Let's be honest. It's here, but that it is evolving. But it might take some time. Because right now it's still for a lot of individuals a little clunky. Anytime you have to wear something or there's some restrictions or there's a physical impact to individuals, you know, like I, some people get a little dizzy in those spaces, et cetera. Um, but it is evolving and it is evolving quickly. And I think it's something that we are absolutely embracing and looking at and exploring. And we're, we're already leveraging that on some projects and exploring new opportunities in that zone. But there's still a little bit of clunkiness to it. And so people that are much more savvy on the, on the metaverse than I are saying, we still got a little bit of time. And if you also look at some of those things that are coming out, they tend to be uh, a little overwhelming and they tend to just kind of be this, this whole sensory assault on individuals. And so we've got to work all of that stuff out, but we absolutely have a generation that has grown up you know, virtually gaming and virtually playing with things. And quite frankly, they have a whole different set of skills. We have surgeons today that can operate remotely because of all that, you know, manipulation that kids were doing with with video controllers. And so there are pluses to this and it is coming. It's just, I don't think it's going to be um, one of the things that we're all actively doing tomorrow. It's evolving slowly, but it's coming. Well, we have our first question from the audience that is a nice segue in here, because if we think about not just designing for people to work in the metaverse, but as design professionals, someone is saying, Tom, uh, do you feel that the face-to-face, hands-on contact between a vendor and designer can be replaced with hybrid meeting? And what would be the ramification? So or would we work with our vendors and manufacturers in the metaverse? Hmm. It's interesting. Um, you know, the metaverse, Kay's right, right? It's 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 here. It's been here for a little while. I mean, back in the day, I would say in the early aughts, you know, HOK was kind of playing around with Second Life and what that would mean to like have a presence there and 
create things for it. And and we're still, you know, grappling with that today with 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 what the metaverse can be. And I think, you know, there's opportunities to create environments, you know, virtual environments for people to meet in. You know, Kay and I've had a lot of conversation about this. That it it could be a really great solution for those folks that, you know, that, that allows our, our clients and their organizations to create a certain level of equity for, for, for people within their organizations, right? It becomes a place, it almost kind of neutral, I would say, in terms of a way in which people can get, gather with a level of equity. And I think that that's interesting and, and cool. And I can't wait to see what we all can start to, to really truly come up with um, around that. And to that end, you know, that would include meeting potentially with vendors. I think if it's a way in which a vendor has the ability to demonstrate products or solutions or different ideas, I think I think our design staff is going to get wickedly into that. Um, I think if it's a way for our designers to learn something about those products and what those manufacturers are offering, then yes, I think it's great. I, we we started this with the pandemic. I can't tell you how many, you know, online meetings we were having with manufacturers showing us products on their on their uh, cameras off their laptops so that they can keep that connection alive with with our design staff as they were we were still designing projects. So we, we knew we had to do it then as a way in which to learn. And I think it's now a tool that is kind of embedded in our design process. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so both Kay and Tom, you've talked in the past about the idea of the workplace today needs to earn the commute. So if a staff person is going to travel 30, 45, 60 minutes to come into the physical place, it needs to reward that, for lack of a better word. And one of the specific things that you've been looking at recently are gathering spaces within the workplace. Can one or both of you talk about why you're focusing on that kind of category of space? Because conference rooms have sucked for a long time. <laughs> Let's just be honest. I, can't, I cannot recall the last time I went into a conference room and it was like, oh my God, this is the most amazing space. It's totally intuitive. It's got all the wall space I need. Like it's got everything, right? Um, I think for far too long, we have shoved the largest rectangular table with the maximum number of chairs that we can in it into a room with a little monitor at the end of the wall. And that doesn't suffice anymore. Um, it quite frankly hasn't for the last 10 years. And we need, we just kind of have gotten into this default of that's what it is, that's what we do, right? And we started to do some research about four or five years ago, Tom, I think it was, and, and really based on a book by David Pearl that says, will there be donuts, which is his argument of the only reason you would go to a meeting is because there would be donuts because they're also horrible. But um, it, he really talks about the seven different types of gathering spaces. And are we designing spaces that are really fit to the need? I mean, if you think about it, if you're a high, a high profile law firm that's in litigation, the type of space you want to have is very, very different than if you're family services and it's more about counseling and, you know, being more congenial, et cetera. And so our team over the last few years, thank God for the younger generation, they have dove in, like just jumped on all of this stuff and they've created this amazing new a set of thought leadership that we have that we've now created workshops around that really help our clients understand what kind of meetings you're having, what is the technology, what's the level of interaction, what's the, the setting, how do you want to make people feel, is, you know, how long are those meetings, so that we can craft the right type of environment. If you think about a meeting more like a theater stage, and the things that we put into that room are the props. And so we need to be intentional about how we're designing those spaces so they can function at a higher level. And, and especially if one of the big reasons you're coming back is to connect, then we've got to create great opportunities for people to do so. And I think that's the point, right, Kay? I mean, the earning the commute is about creating moments where people within an organization can connect that they have, they're there for purpose. It's not just that I'm going to take on, you know, my daily tasks on my computer, sitting in an office when I know now I can do that from almost anywhere. So it's, why am I going there? And it's critical because if, if organizations aren't getting right, getting it right, those folks aren't going to show up unless it's something that's mandated. 
Yeah. And Tom, you know, we've talked a lot about this. I mean, I think one of the biggest, I think there's two big mistakes that clients are making right now. Uh, number one is they're just saying, okay, well, we don't need all these dedicated desks because people aren't here all the time. So let's pluck out a section and just drop in some collaboration spaces. But that's like, I don't know, throwing your peas in the middle of your carrots or your potatoes, right? Like you, we have to think about how are we sequencing these spaces? You don't just dump things in there, right? You have to sequence them so that they're useful, so that they're not impeding the tasks that's happening adjacent to that and that you want them to be accessible, but you have to be thoughtful about where and how you're dropping those elements in. Um, and then I think the other thing is that people are saying, okay, well, the only reason we're coming to the office now is to gather, which I don't believe is true. I believe that we have to rebuild social capital and there's gonna be a big focus on that initially, but people that are getting rid of almost all the dedicated spaces and work points and saying it's all about gathering, I think are going too far to the other extreme sure. and that it, there needs to be a balance between the two. Yeah, I agree with you completely. I think it it's also about creating the right level of experience for talking about earning the commute. So if I'm going to go and we're seeing this time and time again with clients, we're talking about just I love the notion when you, you talked about theater, a lot of it is around this experience and how is it special and unique to our organization so that folks are excited to be a part of it and be in the space and utilize the space you know, to their best advantage. So I think we're, we're dealing with so many things that goes right to your peas and carrots, right? Right. In that work environment, all the way through to what those big gathering spaces are, how are they enforcing social capital? How are they making sure that a, uh, an organization can maintain and grow a culture? Uh, all of that starts to, to really drive what we're designing. And Tom, I think another thing that we're seeing a lot of right now is requests for clients to create kind of scrum spaces or, or areas right. or project teams that they can flex and they can move and they can stay into extended periods and they can adjust the room. And so really thinking about creating a maximum flexibility and the ability for the users to quickly regroup and to reassemble spaces to a variety of settings is another thing we're getting a lot of requests for right now that I think is, is spot on. Yeah. I agree. Those are important tools. Hi, Steph, you're back. Hello, I'm back. So tied to all this, we reached out to our LinkedIn followers and we posted a poll. Maybe some of you participated in it. And the question was, how are you using the workplace to benefit your organization? Maybe not surprisingly, 53% said to support hybrid work. And that seems to be kind of the table stakes. How are we using design to support this new flexible and hybrid environment. 35% said to nurture innovation, 11% to add, uh, excuse me, aid with recruitment and 2% to complement their ESG goals. Any of this surprising you both? No, but I, I will say what I think is really interesting is that a lot of our clients have figured out that people tend to be more loyal to people that they work with and organizations that they bond with than the company that they work for, right? So um, that onboarding process can be really, really critical. It allows you <clears throat> to connect with your colleagues. It allows you to you know, find a friend or find other people that you can go on that journey with. It dips you in the culture. It helps you understand things and assimilate more quickly. And that was kind of harder to do when everybody was scattered to the wind. So we've got clients that are, for instance, using the metaverse. Uh, that have onboarded, you know, tens of thousand people in the metaverse. We have clients that are building retreats and or universities for their organizations where people can go and spend whether it's two or three days or two or three weeks and really kind of have a more extensive onboarding purpose. And what they're finding is the likelihood of retaining those individuals goes up significantly when you can bring them in and having more Im uh, impactful onboarding experience and they're connected with people. It's really difficult to do that, um, to have somebody feel like they're connected when quite frankly, they've never been in the physical space or they've never met individuals before. Well, apropos of your comment about the metaverse, we had another question from our audience. What happens when the internet goes down? <laughs> and then we got to rock it old school, Stephanie. We just got to, you know, yeah, I, right. I actually think, 
and I said this to Tom the other day, I think the best thing that could happen to this country right now, mm-hmm. sorry, is that Zoom would go down for a week because mm-hmm. I just feel like everybody is in this zombie-like state because we're sitting on Zoom calls for an extended period. I'm willing to bet almost everybody is multitasking, which means you're draining your brain twice as fast. You're literally sucking the life. You're just sitting there in this vegetated state. And whatever it is that you're doing when you're multitasking, the quality of what you're doing is diminished. So people feel exhausted and drained and just blah. But then what is being produced is like, what is this, right? And so I think one of the things we really need to think about is when we are getting people back in the office, how do we get them off Zoom calls? I mean, people are sitting in their offices taking Zoom calls because they're so used to be able to, I can keep multitasking when I'm on this Zoom call. I don't have to go into the room because when you're in the room, it's really hard to do that and people not to call you out like, hey, what do you, you know, like you're in this meeting for something. So we've had some really bad habits that we formed mm-hmm. and we need to break those. Sure. But if the <laughs> metaverse goes down, it, it's just like everything else, right? I mean, if you're in the office, it's a party. Everybody's just like kind of pops up from their desk in their rooms and they're like, I, I have no service. All right, let's go have a coffee. Let's, let's right. go to lunch early. Like, I think maybe we'll just get back to some like, I don't know, person to person interaction. Yay. Tom, do you remember when CAD used to go down and people were like, I'm done. Oh my God, like, oh, all the like, time. I like, the whole thing. like I'm dead. I mean, back in the day, we had like a little area for CAD. You had to go into it to get on the computer to do it. Yeah. When you couldn't get in, you're like, uh, I guess I'm going to go used, back and hand sketch. He's used back in the day twice in this I conversation know. already. We're, I'm counting. Yeah, we're all Sorry. dating ourselves. But so clearly we're hearing <laughs> we need to have a very intentional balance between the in real life, in person, physical and always using digital to support as a tool, uh, yeah. which is another good segue. Two, a while ago, we heard a lot on the news about the disruption of Gen Z and how that particular generation had a different approach, had different values and expectations about work and its role in their lives. Yeah. To either of you, are we seeing a, a consistent impact of either Gen Z on the current workplace or just more diversity because we have this even more multi-generational workplace today than in the past? So first of all, I think every generation that comes in has had that said about them. So we just have to keep that in mind, right? Secondly, it's not like we came into the workplace and didn't have any expectations. They might have been slightly different, right? But but every generation comes in, I think, with a little bit of that. What's interesting and what we're finding from the research that we've been doing is that the, the younger generation absolutely uh, wants flexibility, but they also at the same time really value being together because quite frankly, they have the most to gain. You know, they kind of have the weevolution. Uh, several of them have been isolated from each other and that's not necessarily good for our social health or our mental health. Um, and they value being in spaces where they can not only learn from other people and kind of model the behavior, but they can, they can shine. Because quite frankly, we need them as much as they need us to help. And so being together, I think, can be highly beneficial. And there was a, a survey that came out recently that they said, hey, if we could get rid of the office altogether, would you be good with that? And, they, and 77% said, no, we actually value the ability to come together. It's just that they don't necessarily want to do it five days a week nine to five. I think there's a lot of requests right now for more choice about when and where and 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 having that, but it, it doesn't mean that they don't value it. And I think we're just starting to figure this out if we're going to be specific around that particular generation. I mean, they're only, you know, just starting to graduate from college and just starting to, you know, enter into, you know, professional life. And, and so what I'm most intrigued about is let's have this conversation in five years. I want to see what happens then when, you know, we really see a group of individuals starting to impact the culture of these organizations. I think it's going to be for the better. I really do. And we can't get away from AI and metaverse. Another question from our, our followers here, specifically for UK, 
Okay. Do you see this influx of AI technology in the metaverse and that integration into the workplace? Is that going to be a benefit to people who may be neurodivergent? Uh, a benefit, a boon, a challenge? Yeah, so um, the, the, we, had, we had a great session last week in New York. We did a whole workshop with a whole group of individuals around neurodiversity. And uh, one of the things AJ Perrin said that was echoed by Scott Gibson of uh, Melwood was that the oh. iPad was revolutionary for people that were neurodiverse because in many times they're using technology to aid and assist. And before they stood out because of that. Now it can go with them everywhere and they just kind of blend in and fit in with everyone else. And there's all these great tools. But the one thing I will say is that uh, people that are neurodiverse are just as social as everybody else. Yes, there are some that have anxiety and find it difficult to be in shared spaces, but there are also many that might be ADHD that need to be in spaces because they might be procrastinators or they need that direction or they need feedback or they need that social stimulation. And so for some people that were neurodiverse and or even physical disabilities or anybody that had lifestyle challenges, being able to work remotely might have been a benefit. But for others, it was a disaster because they were more isolated. They didn't, they didn't have that connection. They didn't have that guidance that they might have needed. And so I think it depends on the individual. But the answer, I believe, is yes, it can absolutely help. But we should not just assume that a whole group of individuals all should continue to work remotely forever and that this is going to solve the problem. Some love it, some don't. And we need, again, to create that balance so that we're hitting all the right points for everyone. Wonderful. Thank you. You alluded in the past, Kay, with your frustration with video calls, that we, especially when we were all working from home during the pandemic, we packed our schedules, call after call after call. Um, how do we now, as we are going back to the office and we're in these hybrid settings, are there ways that we can design the office to help support the efficiency that we we benefited from with that not having to move and not even being able to go up and get a glass of water. But yeah. are there design solutions that can help with that? Yeah. So Tom, we, we've talked a lot about this. Uh, you know, I, I think that hybrid is actually, I believe, more of an operational model than yes. it is a workplace solution. And if you are not putting in policies or practices, I mean, if, I, if I'm accepting, you know, 10 hours of straight Zoom calls a day, bad on me. Right. And, and th there's nothing that I'm going to do in the workplace that's going to counter bad behavior and or bad policies or bad practices. I can encourage and I can create great spaces, but they have to be supplemented and supported by helping people understand the right behaviors, helping people put it, you know, whether it's policies, procedures, et cetera. We have some clients that are basically saying on certain days, any meetings we're scheduling on those days, we want them to be in person. And, you know, you're either all in or you're all out. That's an extreme response, yeah. but they, it's hard to do a little bit of both. It is. And so we have to break ourselves out of that. So, yeah, Tom. I think, you know, there's a couple of organizations we've been talking to that have created policies to say, you know, there are not going to be Zoom meetings and everyone has to be sitting in the same room or conversely, everyone has to be virtual in order for the meeting to be and to feel, which is, I think, a big part of it, successful, right? Like, we're going to get a positive outcome uh, from being together. But the havesies is, is a huge challenge. And I think there are things from a design perspective that we can do to help it. We've had, Kay and I have had this conversation with lots of clients together about, you know, that singular screen in the room with lots of little squares at the bottom with little heads in them you know, does not create a sense of equity in the meeting room because you're not visibly present. Yeah. And so seeing organizations really make investment in lots of screen technology where you can start to get those virtual participants at a scale where you really can see and interact with them 
is critical, but not everyone's going to be able to do that or afford to do that. So I think these policies really do matter. And and we end up, Kay and I end up having more conversations with clients around operations and policies, first and foremost, before we start delving into what design solutions could potentially be. And if there's not alignment inside the organization on those ideas of policies, on how people are getting managed, what that all means, then the design solutions aren't going to work. That's my thought. Darn it. Darn it. Uh, You get the last word. Um, Yeah. Very sensitive to people's time. I want to thank everyone for your questions and your comments. I heard a lot, uh, and the comments will be responded to. You know, Kay and Tom go back in on LinkedIn and they respond to people. So definitely keep an eye out there. But I definitely heard AI has been around, it enhances our operation and the experience of users, there's potential there, but it is disruptive. So let's figure out there are things that we don't know yet. The same with the metaverse, it's evolving. It could be a tool. It is not maybe something to be so afraid of, the fear mongering. Uh, And especially I think the idea, Tom, of how designers can use it more Mm -hmm. and approach it as a resource and a tool. Intentional gathering spaces being really thoughtful about how, how, where, why, what are your goals for this? Gen Z wants flexibility and balance like many of us, um, but they have slightly different values. And then operational solutions need to come hand in hand with design solutions for all of this to really be meaningful. You summed it up well. Look at you. Great. Well, and again, follow us. If you don't follow Kay and Tom on LinkedIn, please do share your comments and this will live on our LinkedIn feed if you want to continue to engage. Thanks everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Bye.